Welcome again. Next up is Fred Archibald, Victor Echo One Foxtrot Alpha, and he's going to be giving us a talk on air sea rescue as it related to World War II and a special radio which he'll be demonstrating here on the side called the Gibson Girl. Fred's always been interested in radio. He's had three years training and repair of HF transmitting in the U.S. Army. Uh, he's been a Canadian amateur since 1987. He's been a member of HARC, Halifax Amateur Radio Club, for countless years. Yeah, 2003. He's also run um, or led some of the training with regard to the advanced amateur course when we used to do import in-person courses uh, here in Halifax. He's interested in IOTA, Islands on the Air, DX Expeditions, Restoring Classic Radios. And if you get to the museum tomorrow, you'll see uh, a radio that uh, Fred restored uh, that's on display, fully operational. I know we were down there uh, about a month ago, and we had it up op operating and uh, pulling in stations from all over. That is a CM-11, yeah. It was on Canadian warships probably in the 50s. And without uh, further ado, we'll pass, pass it over to Fred and enjoy his presentation. Well, uh, this is, is it? Oh, that works too. Okay. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for the introduction. I, I know most of you. I see some pretty familiar faces out there. Anyway, this talk is uh, something that uh, interest, has interested me for quite a while, and it's about World War II and um, air sea rescue. And uh, can you can you read that? Can you see that all right? Yeah, okay. Anyway, uh, I'm going to be talking about a very special transmitter called the Gibson Girl, which was invented for just this purpose. And uh, in, in World War II, at the beginning, uh, of course, things were very grim for Britain and the whole world. So they realized early on that aircraft are going to be essential. There's going to be a very large number of them. And uh, they really didn't have much of a system for rescuing people from the water. So ASR, Air Sea Rescue, was given a high priority and maximum resources were uh, put towards it. Uh, and three good reasons. One, for the morale of the men. Early in the war, well, during the war, I, I'm just talking about uh, two groups, really, Bomber Command, which was the British bombers, and the 8th Air Force, which is the American bombers. And, uh, and the numbers that you will see don't include all the men who died in transport aircraft, in patrol aircraft, and in fighter aircraft. This is, this is just bombers we're talking about here, although the radio helped all those other groups too. So they did it for morale because early in the war, Britain asked 30 missions from the, their uh, uh, air crew. In 30 missions, your chance of surviving 30 missions without being a prisoner, seriously wounded, or dead was about one in four. So you join knowing that there's a 75% chance you not come out or not come out in good shape. The second simply is to conserve a vital resource. As the war went on, more and more equipment was available, but there's nothing to replace a trained air crew. You can train new people, but they're not nearly as effective as people that really know what they're about. The third is simply humanitarian, of course. The fewer people that uh, died, the better. Next slide. Okay, this is, uh, this is a plane that actually made it back, B-17, actually made it back from Germany. And uh, as it landed, it, its back broke. And you can see the different angle on the, on the rear part of the fuselage. The uh, hole there is, uh, sadly enough, just to the front, uh, the, the hole on this side is just where the radio operator sits. And just beside him, on the right side, is the waste gunner. So I doubt that they survived, but the rest of the crew got back. But uh, they were unusually lucky. For over a thousand planes went into the channel and surrounding waters during the war. So enormous number of 
uh, planes went in. Next, this is just another example. Uh, the bombardier probably didn't fare too well. He would have been up front in this, unless he'd gone back, which would have been a good idea. Anyway, another B-17, and uh, these are the ones that made it back. A huge number did not. Uh, next. So uh, these are numbers I found. Again, this is just for the, uh, the bombers. So the EPO just means the European Theater of Operations, as they called it in the time, which was fighting Italy and Germany. And uh, so in the 8th Air Force, there was 55,000 uh, killed and captured, 8,400 seriously wounded. And in the British Bomber Command, which includes Canadians and uh, other Dominion countries, uh, 38,300 killed, 10,000 Canadians died in Bomber Command and about 6,600 other allies. So this is, this is kind of big time. And they really felt, we have to come up with a system to do everything we can for these men. And uh, if you look at their efficiency in rescue, in 1939 and 40, about 12% of crews that were known to have gone into the water were rescued. So one chance in eight, if you got your feet wet, one chance in eight, you'd, you'd live through it. Uh, by 1945, it had risen from 12% to 90%. So, of course, this was a huge boost to morale, and it was hugely important. Uh, and uh, so, this is kind of putting the, the end at the beginning, but um, in the European theater, the, the ASR system that the British and the U.S. developed uh, rescued 1,972 air crew, and in the Pacific, which is mostly U.S., 1,841. So the system and the radio I'm going to describe were uh, uh, basically saved 4,000 men. Okay, next. Okay. And, of course, what they called it was ditching. And this was an unfortunately very common theme. Here are the, uh, they had little rubber rafts. Um, in, in fighter aircraft, for instance, they actually very often had the rubber rafts strapped to the parachute. But in uh, multi-engine planes, they had these little rafts. Don't, don't think of a, uh, a, a firm bottom, rigid raft. Uh, think of, uh, it's all soft rubber, almost more like a child's toy. So very difficult to uh, do any sort of work or operation. Next slide. Okay, so in 39 to 41, if you had the misfortune to fall in the water, uh, in, especially if it was winter or foul weather, you'd be unseen, unheard, never found, and dead within seven days and much sooner in winter. So the outlook was uh, pretty grim. Next. Uh, so when they were trying to set up a system, basic question, how do you know that there are forced landing survivors in the sea? If you think about the British, for instance, they were bombing mostly at night. So you leave with 35 planes. When you get back home, there's only 32. Where did the other three go? The prob nobody probably saw. So they didn't know whether there was anybody to be rescued. And of course, then how can you quickly locate and get to the downed air crew? So these, the question was answered actually in the 30s by at least the U.S. and Germany. I don't know if Britain tried something or not. Was a battery-powered transmitter sitting there just ready to go. Um, Many trials by both the U.S. and Germany showed it just wasn't practical. To You had to have something small and light to, to handle. I mean, you have uh, your, your, your crew are tired and shocked and maybe wounded, and they're trying to get from their sinking plane, which is probably sinking quite quickly, into a, fl a flimsy little rubber raft, and you couldn't have something big and heavy. Uh, and the batteries just didn't last. The, the dry cells and what, what cells they had in those days. Remember, the plane is... Uh, going from uh, a moderate temperature on the runway to minus 30 or 40 up in the sky. The pressure's going up and down, air pressure's going up and down. The battery's just, uh, it didn't work for long enough, if it worked at all, to be useful. Next. Um, in 1941, a British patrol boat was out in the channel uh, looking for what it might find, and it spotted a little yellow uh, uh, raft. They got to it, it was a German raft, and it had this contraption in it. And this was called the NS2, the Not Sunda 2 device. Uh, and it was a hand crank generator, which put out five watts at 500 kilohertz, 600 meters. And uh, 
Oh, they brought it back. It was taken apart. And uh, I've just put here some numbers so you'll see that this was then copied first by the British and then by the Americans. And uh, it, had a, it, it was a heck of a lot better than nothing, but it had some issues. Uh, ah, there's Jason. I can say that we're talking about a 600-meter transmitter here, so it may apply to your, your thing. Anyway, uh, it, uh, you had to crank it at 120 RPM, which turns out to be non-ergonomic. It's very, very hard to do for any length of time. People get exhausted very quickly. Uh, 80 RPM was what the Allies first used, and this was much, much better. Although the load is heavier because you're gearing, uh, these both run a little uh, twin generator which puts out uh, at 5,000 RPM. So you're converting the 80 or 120 to 5,000 as you turn the machine. Um, actually, the Allies finally went to about 48 RPM, which was even better. Uh, although it's heavier to turn, uh, it's much more compatible with the speed that your, your limbs are comfortable with. Uh, they got the, this is uh, 29 pounds. The, the one that resulted was 18 pounds. It doesn't sound like much, but it makes a big difference when you're handling it in a little flimsy raft. No leg strap. The reason it has this shape is because you put it between your legs with the front facing outwards, and that's where the antenna comes from. And of course, it comes with a pipe, Measure. It doesn't very well. You can't see that. Anyway, that the, the door that comes out, that's a kite reel with a brake on the front, and it's got about 300 feet of wire on it. Uh, anyway, so to put your antenna up, you needed to use a box cut. And uh, if it was calm, with this machine, you were out of luck. You couldn't put your antenna up, and you wouldn't be heard. Next. So the Brits built the T13. Uh, 1333, uh, and it had some improvements over that. It still had some weaknesses, but the biggest weakness was that this was uh, in 1941, and Brits simply didn't have the industrial uh, availability. Every, everything they could make was being turned out at a feverish pace. They didn't have the resources or the time or the people to build something like this. So uh, they... Uh, uh, sent a request to the U.S., and uh, uh, if you see, the phrase they used was that they wanted as many of these as could be built as soon as humanly possible. Uh, and this is, this is late in 1941, I think December. Uh, next. And this is what they came up with. And this is uh, what's called the BC-778. Uh, you'll see a lot of old American circles will be BC this or BC that. That black box there. It's a BC-348, for instance. That's a, a, a common receiver. And BC just means basic component. It's, it's the heart of, of some system. And, and in this case, the, it's a transmitter, but it's the heart of a system that has a variety of accessories that come with it. And uh, it uh, basically, it, it down to 18 pounds. It's good. You can see those big straps on the side. And uh, I've used one of these. And if you say, don't use the straps, you try to hold that hourglass between your legs. Uh, you've got, we've all got great strong quadriceps muscles on the front, but very weak little muscles to uh, open and close our legs. And you, you try to crank the thing, and it's uh, fairly heavy, and it wants to slide out from between your legs, and you have to push them together really hard. Uh, it, it's extremely exhausting. You put that big belt on, and you, your legs don't have to do anything. They just, the, the belt holds it in place, so the, the belt is um, a huge advantage. It was designed and built by Bendix of North Hollywood, California, uh, and in the course of the war, they produced 100,000 of these, and they were in, in ships, they were in, uh, of, of all sizes and shapes, they were in uh, planes of all sorts, and actually after the war, they were still they were available for next to nothing, and uh, for instance, you fairly often see ones with a little black label KLM on them. And most of the airlines in the world would uh, put one or two of these aboard if they were crossing oceans. And uh, it's, uh, uh, anyway, there's a lot of improvements over that old not send that to of the Germans. Uh, next uh, slide. And this is where the name comes, comes from, the Gibson girl, that uh, soldiers do have, tend to have ladies on their mind fairly often. 
and they looked at that hourglass shape and, and uh, Charles Dana Gibson was, was a fashion designer back about 1900 and uh, uh, so everybody would know of his uh, beautifully drawn women. Okay, next. Actually, the first one that came out was called the BC 778. That's, that's the one there. And this was on 500 uh, kilohertz, 600 meters. And its antenna, when fully extended, was um, uh, uh, 0.15 wavelengths or 300 feet. And they, they chose this because it was the longest antenna they found that they could reliably get up off the surface of the ocean. If they tried to make it longer, like we'd all say, oh, a quarter wave would be, would be very ni nice. Uh, it just was difficult. Too often, the kite would fall into the sea, and the kite was waterproofed, but the waterproofing was, after two or three good dunks, the kite absorbed so much water that, that you couldn't get it up again. Remember, one of the challenges is that uh, I'm sure you've all flown a kite. Well, what, what do you do when you want to get the kite in the air? Well, you run along the beach or you run across the field. Well, if you're in a little life raft, uh, that's not a, an available option. So you've got to get it up uh, by just holding it. And anyway, so they, they settle on 0.15 wavelengths. And the whole output circuit in the radio was designed for the quite high uh, impedance that, that uh, produced. As a matter of fact, there's a big knob on the front there on, on your left, which is, is to tune it. There's a, a little mark. By the way, all the, the lettering is, is luminescent, so if you're at night, you can still read the thing and operate it. <coughs> it's, a ra it's a transmitter that's designed to be operated by somebody with no prior experience with radios. You know, if the radio operator happens to be in your lifeboat, well, that's great. Let him do it. But if, if you've got a bunch of waste gunners or, or Whatever, um, you uh, just read the top of the box and it's up there. Now, this worked very well. It had a range of 150 to 250 miles, uh, excuse me, 250 to 500 miles. And it was used around Britain and that was fine because um, if you could put out a signal of 250 to 500 miles radius, uh, there was all sorts of ships and planes and, and land stations which were listening on 500 kilohertz, because that was the international distress frequency. And uh, you would be heard. Uh, however, when it came to the Pacific, the problem was very different, because uh, islands were thousands of miles apart. 250 to 500 miles wouldn't work. So what do you do? Uh, well, let's make a 500 watt one. Now, good luck carrying and cranking a 500 watt transmitter. So they couldn't, they really couldn't raise the power. So what they did was, it's, it's got a lot of mechanical logic inside, and mechanical logic inside. And uh, they decided, well, well, the, the uh, uh, medium frequency 500 kilohertz is still useful in many occasions, but we need to have a higher frequency. So they've got, they actually started with an 8.2 meg frequency. They went to an 8.3 meg frequency, two frequencies which were already uh, aircraft and ship emergency frequencies. So they were already, uh, the, the specific receivers were in ships and on <coughs> land and in other, <coughs> excuse me, other planes. And, uh, so the, the, all they had to change was the machine itself. Uh, interestingly enough, in the original, uh, there was no crystal. They just used an LC circuit because uh, the thing had to be rugged and you threw it out of a plane into the water or it slammed against the side of the plane. Uh, you didn't want a crystal to break. Uh, so LC circuit, but when they got to 8,300 kilohertz, kilocycles, let's stay in the old, uh, you, needed, uh, you needed a crystal. You, you couldn't make a stable uh, LC circuit at that time for 8,300 kilohertz. So, so it, the BC778 is the 500 uh, kilohertz only. CRT3, they've got the two, 500 and 88.3 megs. So this one uh, could be heard in the Pacific uh, for up to 3,000 miles. So you've got, you've got the range. Next. Okay, this is the gear that comes in the kit. It, the, each transmitter comes in its own special bag. Well, I should mention that uh, uh, one thing I really like about this equipment is it's, it's been very thoroughly thought out. 
and every part that you might break or drop over the side or need a second of, they have duplicates and even triplicates in a few places. For instance, uh, here, you see those two little disks there? Those are spare reels of 300 feet of wire. Uh, there's one in the radio to begin with, and then you've got two spares in case you break one or break two, you can still do it. Um, they solved the problem of what do you do in a calm by uh, giving those two little yellow cans there each contain about a three and a half or four foot diameter latex balloon. They're in a sealed can, and those of you old enough will remember getting coffee in a can where you've got a key on the top and you break the key off and you tongue on the edge and you wind it around so you open the sealed can easily. They did that with both these big gray cans and the little orange cans. The little orange cans are the balloons. The big gray cans are a chemical called calcium hydride. And calcium hydride, you, you take the end of the can off in your life raft, you reach down and you dip up uh, uh, seawater, you fill it with seawater, and then you quickly push see those two silver, uh, those are pipes there with the little fake light handles. You push that in, and the other end goes in the balloon, and the balloon fills with hydrogen. The handles are there because the whole uh, water plus calcium hydride gets very hot, so uh, you don't want to get that in the can. Anyway, so you have two chances with the two cans and the two things there, and the two, so you, you've got two balloons. <coughs> if you don't get it right with the first one, you've got a second one. And uh, you see this little gadget here? That's, uh, that's a wrench that uh, on the actual transmitter, most of the things you have to unscrew are big. And you say, I, I could do that. But could you do it when you're exhausted and your hands have been softened by hours in seawater? And the answer is not always. So they gave you a big universal wrench so you could loosen anything that needed to be loosened. And there's the kite. And the kite's a, a beautiful design too. That uh, it's, got, it's got an elaborate aluminum structure to it. And it comes apart in the middle, so you have two pieces. And that bump in the bag is where the kite sits and where those two hydrogen tubes sit. Uh, to pull the kite out, it's in two pieces. You just push four little rods together. And in the center of each, you pull this. There's an X there that's folded down. You just pull it up. It snaps up, and the whole kite gets tensioned and is ready to go. So very, very easy to do. Actually, the way they designed it, apparently, was... Uh, uh, they were in North Hollywood, and somewhere there was a big swimming pool. So they started by designing the, uh, the radio. They'd throw the radio in the pool, uh, in, in the bag, and they'd have somebody jump in with an uninflated uh, life raft under their arm. They'd pull the CO2 cartridge, it would inflate, he'd hop in, and then he would assemble the radio and get it working. Uh, when that worked, when they got all the little wrinkles sorted out so that that could be done by... Uh, somebody who wasn't at all expert in this sort of thing. They went out to the Pacific Ocean and did the same thing. And when they had a design that uh, a person who'd never done it before could successfully get the radio working out in the Pacific, then they said, okay, this is something that uh, we'll go with. And they, uh, the Brits, at the end of 1941, gave them the all, if, uh, as soon as humanly possible request. And by May of 42, it was in mass production, and ultimately 100,000 of them were made. Uh, next. This is the top of the machine, and uh, the black knob in the center is just a seal for the crank. So you take that off, and you install a crank, which has a square, square shoulder, very stout, nice design. Now those two little black dots at the top, they're the instrument system of this. Uh, the one on the uh, uh, left, as you look at it, you start cranking, and uh, you hear the, the, the generator whining inside. And once you're up, but there's not much load, but once you get up to the right generator speed to produce 6 volts for filaments and 350 volts for the plate, that li a little light will pop on in there because there's a low voltage cutout. Now, if you try to go faster, uh, you can only go a little bit faster, and then it gets really, really hard because they have a governor. And if you go over speed, the governor has two arms which fly out, you know, classic governor, and they drag on a little uh, cylinder in there. And so uh, going too fast is really hard. Going too slow, the light goes out. And it's actually, so, so it turns out it's surprisingly easy to stay in that range. Now the other one, this machine has uh, a number of automatic codes that can send out. You can switch them with a knob on the front. And 
you crank and crank and all of a sudden you start to, it's got a, a little neon tube and it starts to flash and it flashes with the code so you know flash 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 so you can read the code that's going out and the neon tube with a, a limiting resistor is right on the wire that goes out to the antenna so if that's flashing you know that you're putting out RF which is I presume infinitely reassuring if you're way out in the middle of the ocean uh, next and you can see every, everything was there, the little diagrams of how you set it all up. And here's another diagram. And uh, this is where I got a lot of my information. You see, this is from what is called the ROIF. And if you see, that page has, has holes along the edge. It goes into a standard uh, bi binder. And every crew member on uh, a bomber would have his own uh, information folder. This was radio operator's information folder. So each uh, specialty, whether you are ball turret gunner or a navigator or bombardier or captain uh, pilot, you would have your own folder and uh, it, uh, they put it in a binder like this because periodically every few weeks or every month or two you'd get something to add to it and they'd all say throw out pages 28 to 34, put something new in and this is how the whole crew kept up with the latest technology and the latest techniques to stay in the air and not get shot down and do carry out your mission successfully. And uh, I put this up. Uh, I can't quite read it. Can you enlarge it a little bit there? Okay, I can, I can actually read it since you're all right. Uh, yeah. uh, on the, over on the uh, right side, I can fade in here. What, so what they're doing there is they're showing the uh, uh, estimated coverage of this 5 watt Six, uh, 600 meter, 500 kilohertz radio, and w oh, what it has is one of those little uh, black knobs on the front. You unscrew the knob and you throw it over the side uh, of, the, of the life raft. And uh, why you do that is because it's attached to 16 feet of this fine uh, woven bronze wire, which is your 16 foot ground into the perfect ground, salt water. And if you do that out in the ocean, then you get the 250 to 500 miles. If you did the same thing in fresh water in a, a large lake, you would go to between 50 and 150 miles. You get a three to five fold decrease in your range by going from salt water to fresh water. If you are on the edge of a stream, you're down to 20 or 30 mile radius. And if you just have a ground and damp earth, then it goes down to five to 10 miles. So. Uh, Note to anybody operating in this region, the ground is extremely important. And if you can get the best ground, salt water, then you're, you're, you're doing well. Okay, next one. Okay, this is, this is how the whole system looks. It's a little bag, and it'll be hung in, it, in, a, in a given plane near the exit that's most likely to be used if you uh, come down at sea or come down in water. You see the little metal uh, hook there? It just goes on a hook, so the first fellow there will grab it. And uh, if you don't have a life raft, you're better off jumping in the sea with that because the whole kit makes a good life preserver. As a matter of fact, the, the transmitter alone outside of the kit is very buoyant. Uh, they made it relatively big for its weight. Uh, well, it's only eight, uh, six, 18 pounds, and it's quite a large box. So, uh, and you can even, if you tie yourself with the, the leg straps to it, you could float comfortably for, for a long time. Uh, okay, next. Now some of them uh, came with a little parachute. And if you first think about it, say, why would you want to do that? Because if your, your, your pilot is, you know, let's say two of your engines are gone and you're, nah, anyway, your plane's in rough shape, he's coming down, of course, he doesn't want to go nose first into the water. That'll destroy the plane and you as well. He's coming down at a, uh, an angle as close to horizontal as he can make it with the nose up so that he hits back. And, and uh, so if you said, oh, we're about to go down, I'll throw this out uh, with a parachute, uh, that's no good because when you finally stop, you might be two miles away and you're never going to get back to your, your transmitter. But what this was for was search planes that went out later. And so if they spotted a, um, you remember, most of the search planes couldn't land on water. So all they could do was find, you know, radio back, we found some... Uh, air crew in a rubber raft, or we found a, uh, uh, a lifeboat with some sailors in it. Uh, if, the, if the boat or the raft does, doesn't have a Gibson Gale, 
Well, they would they come down low as slow as they could, and they'd drop one or two off that, as close as they could so they could be picked up. Because one of the problems was it was all very well to find these people that needed rescue, but it might take a day or two till they could get a float plane out there. There was not that many PBYs and similar planes. Uh, so uh, in a day or two, they could have drifted 100 miles. So uh, this way, you're giving them the, the uh, transmitter, and they can be followed by direction find. Next. Uh, this is just a corner of the uh, kite, and there's, they give you two places to attach it. First is 15 to 40 mile an hour wind. You attach it at the top corner. If the wind is 7 to 20, you attach it at that point about 8 or 9 inches down. And uh, if it was below 7, uh, you'd better get the balloons out. Next. The Brits tried <laughs> something which uh, didn't work that well, actually. Uh, they took a, a flare pistol and they developed a ro long rocket that fit in the end of the flare pistol. From the rocket, there was a string to uh, a cylinder which contained a kite which would pop out and form into a proper box kite. And so the idea was you shot it up. The, as the rocket went up, it would pull the kite out, get it launched into the air. But the tug of the cord on the back tended to turn them around, and apparently the first couple times they tried it, they sank the life raft, which wasn't quite what they needed. Uh, okay, next. Okay, this is, uh, this is the alternative. This is using the balloon. And uh, as I said, the little, you really needed the little container for it because uh, it was uh, latex rubber, which uh, is great stuff when it's fresh, but if you leave it exposed to oxygen or light for a while, it hardens and cracks. And uh, some of you have probably used for various purposes gum rubber tubing. Used to be used a lot in medicine and so forth. And it gets to a certain stage and it's, it's, it's no good. So, but you seal it, uh, I think they sealed them in nitrogen. So you seal the, the balloon in nitrogen and, and you open the top as you would an old coffee can and you, you know, Bob's your uncle, you're ready to go. Under here, just for those of you with a chemical turn, it's the calcium hydride is hit by water you immediately get the evolution of uh, substantial hydrogen, and you're left with calcium hydroxide, which is like lye, sodium hydroxide. It's quite corrosive. So you, uh, once you've used it, you probably just drop the thing in the sea. Next. Uh, I'm not going to analyze the schematic for you, but I'll point out a couple of things. It ran on two tubes. Uh, they were both uh, the, the metal tubes of the day, which were far more rugged than the glass tubes, and rugged was everything. Uh, and below here, there's a modulator, and of course there's the power oscillator output stage, if you like, which is the, the tube in the middle there. And no crystal. And if you look below, there's simply uh, an inductor, it's, it's a pole pitch oscillator, and an inductor and uh, some capacitors. Now, one problem with running your antenna essentially directly off your oscillator tube is that the antenna, for instance, if your antenna is down close to the water, let's say there's a strong wind and your kite or your balloon is down close to the water compared to straight up in the air, it, its characteristics are going to change a lot. And uh, if the char characteristics of the antenna, the, the antenna is really part of the oscillator if you uh, use a, like a triode. Uh, what they did here is, uh, uh, I, I can't keep straight with you all, you'll have to take my word for it, but it's what's called an electron coupled oscillator that the, the, uh, the screen grid is actually the plate for the oscillator circuit. And the, that triode is uncoupled by uh, the electrons going to the plate. So this is much more resistant to having the frequency shift. Uh, I have checked one of these machines, and I found that uh, uh, after 80 years, that little LC circuit is still within one kilohertz of 500 kilohertz. And you see in the middle here, there's a uh, connector. And that's just a standard Jones connector. They're still around. And what it separates is the whole upper part, the radio. Oh, no, I should say. The upper part is all attached to the face of the radio. So you take the face off, and there's half the circuit. And the other half is bolted to the case. And it has to be. Down here is your, your gear. The gearing is actually very sophisticated because it's rotating a lot of things. There's a switch down here that shifts the signal you send every 20 seconds. You've got three code disks here, which select which of several four options you had as to just what message to send. And, uh, anyway, it's uh, 
And there's a, there's a generator down there for the bus driver, the full 5,000 watt unit. But, uh, and the message is it's timed, and all the timing is mechanical from various gears. So the gearbox is uh, it's quite a big thing in the case, and it's, it's pretty sophisticated inside. Uh, okay, next. This, this, is, this is what's attached to the case. And as I mentioned, the uh, metal tube, two metal tubes. And uh, so what this put out was what we would call A2, modulated CW, not just a simple carrier as, as, as uh, uh, you would use today for CW. And uh, why would you think that, why, why go to modulated CW? You know, if, if, you, if, you did, if you got rid of the modulation, you'd, you'd cut the thing down to one tube and probably be easier to crank. Well, the reason that they use modulated is uh, some radios have a BFO and some don't. If you don't have a BFO, you're not going to hear this thing if it isn't modulated. It's just, just, like just a carrier, so it's silent. Uh, you might be heard really if, if, if the radio is really close to you simply because you, it, it has a quieting effect, but it, it, would, it would have poor range. So, uh, and the other reason is that if you do have a radio with a BFO, maybe you haven't switched it on doesn't matter with this then. Uh, and it spreads the signal out a bit because you've got the sum and the difference of the carrier plus the carrier, so a little wider signal. And it doesn't matter if your BFO is off or on. Okay, next. Oh, uh, actually, just go back, one, one more thing. Yeah, I'll just point out that uh, this white thing here is actually uh, the um, frequency determining element in, in the power oscillator along with, uh, well, there were six capacitors, one of those there. Anyway, I don't know what the white stuff is, but it's, it's hard and it's uh, done just great for 80 years. Uh, they almost always work. You get an old one and turn the crank and it's, it's operating. Uh, yeah, and up here for, for the antenna tuning, uh, there's a capacitor and it's, it's gold plated, which is a, a nice thing to do because if any moisture gets inside, if that gets all corroded, it really cuts the efficiency of the output down. You lose half or two thirds of your power. So they gold plate it if that's needed. And the tubes, the, the, they're metal, they're held in place by springs so they can't jump out. There's one on either end there. And, and uh, okay, uh, next. Here's the rest of the thing. You can see the three code wheels there. And, and here's, the, here's the computer, here's the logic system. You see those four terminals there? The wires with the, the loop terminals are five, six, seven, and eight. The screws underneath are one, two, three, and four. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, and uh, by switching them around, you can select a variety of messages to send. Now, this isn't something you're going to do in your life raft. This is done by the mechanics back at the base. And uh, it, it also tells you that they get a certain message back and uh, that all of your unit, your, your squadron uses, then, oh, okay, it's one of ours. If they're using this sequence of the messages. Uh, anything else? Oh, down there in the corner there's a, a relay. That's the cutout so that it doesn't, uh, the generator doesn't apply voltage to the radio until you're up to the proper operating speed. It's much easier on the radio too because you don't have wildly varying voltages. But this of course, the code wheel has got, these are the little transducers if you like, opening and closing when it goes over the various bumps and, and separate code wheels. Okay, next. So, I, just a quick look to show you. This is what you'd see in the, the manual, and it's linked together terminals whose numbers are one and six, four and five. You get 20 seconds of SOS followed by a solid dash. Any reason, a, anybody hazard a guess as to why they really like a solid dash? Yes, exactly. If you try to direction find, on CW and your meter's leaping around, it's difficult to do. You can do it, but it's way easier if it, if it uh, breaks off. Okay, next. Uh, this was another thing that was developed uh, to make this, using this uh, transmitter easier or increase the chances of success, let's put it that way. And uh, you're probably mostly familiar that uh, on the, uh, the right is a German one, on the left is an Allied one. In the middle is, could be from anywhere but after the war. The green wedges are for uh, another frequency, 2182, 2162, something like that. Yeah. 
the red are for 500 kilohertz. And what they are is uh, six minutes out of an hour in which everybody is supposed to be listening to these emergency frequencies, this emergency frequency. And so most aviators have a watch, so hopefully somebody in your boat has a watch that's still running. And so instead of cranking for an hour, which it's, it's not bad, but uh, to crank that thing for an hour would be grim. So uh, you go on for those six minutes out of the hour, and uh, you're much more likely to be heard, and it saves your energy. And, uh, okay, uh, yeah, I won't say any more now. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Now, there was a second way you could use this thing, and first it might seem trivial, but it's not, that uh, when you look at the front of the machine, uh, there's six positions for the, the function switch there, and there's this uh, manual, you can send manual CW, although I would challenge anybody in this room who thinks they're good at CW to send clean CW in this thing, because strapped between your legs, you're cranking the heck out of it, and then you have to reach around front and push a button while you're cranking the heck out of it, and it's, it's moving around between your legs, and uh, uh, anyway, but the thing is, you're not trying to, to, to send uh, the Gettysburg address, you're trying to get some really basic message across. And if you've got the radio operator there, or what's better is if the radio operator is in a, a life raft with several other uh, crew members, one of the other crew members cranks, and the radio operator just gets to the front and pokes the button. Uh, so this, this was one of the things, and, and so there's a little plug. You just plug this light in. Uh, next slide. Okay, and here again is, is something from the information folder. Nice using these because this is exactly what the crews read at the time and exactly what they learned. Uh, and the two ways you use it are, one, uh, you're, you're out there at night and you hear a plane coming over. And, and in most cases, uh, the crew would recognize the type of plane from the sound of the engine. I mean, German bombers didn't sound like B-17s or B-24s. Uh, and uh, you hear the plane, it's getting louder, but you realize that uh, once it gets close, the direction finding doesn't work well at all because you're right under the, the plane or you're uh, just in front of it or just behind it. So uh, when it gets sufficiently loud, you throw the switch around to the other position and what you've been sending, whether it's SOS or uh, AA or dash, will be flashed by the light. And the light is the same bulb that you see glowing. And uh, so you say, that won't do much. But the planes flew at night. Typically, they flew at uh, 2,000 to 3,000 feet because that was a compromise between being really high, which you see a huge swath of ocean, and being able to, to, to see the, the folks in the life raft. So it's around 2,000 feet. And at 2,000 feet in the dark ocean, that little bulb is perfectly visible. The other thing is that when you're first out of the plane, uh, let's say, B-17 has 10 crew, uh, you know, glands in the water, some of you may be wounded, you'll all be exhausted, uh, you're floundering around in the ocean, you've got to get out quick as quick because the plane is sinking. Uh, so very often people are lost and you might hear them calling, but somebody in the water in the open ocean calling, very, very hard to tell where they're calling from. They're just out there somewhere. Well, you can just pull the transmitter out of his bag, put the crank in, and plug the light in. You don't have to mess around with antennas and all the rest of it. And you can crank, and you've got a fairly bright light. You can search the water for missing buddies or anything else that's floating that, that you might need like food. So the light was very, very useful. Next. OK, just a quick look at what uh, would be looking for you in, in the search plane. This is, uh, again, it's Bendix equipment. And I think that's why they chose Bendix to build this thing, because Bendix was building uh, all the electronics to find, uh, locate particular transmitters. So this is aircraft equipment. Uh, and like a lot of aircraft equipment, uh, electronics in the day was big and bulky. And it was designed to fit in a variety of planes. So what they do, they put 90% of it in a big box you could shove anywhere, just out of the way. And then you ran cables up, so this little head here is only uh, about six inches by four inches or something. And you can mount that where you want. So the navigator looks something like this. And like this goes from 150 to 1500. 
because they would use broadcast stations as well as marine and aviation beacons as, as points, and they'd have a map, and, and all these would be located on the map. So you find a station on 1440, uh, you look at the map, oh, that's, that's uh, outside Paris or whatever. Very useful. Uh, down here, this is what they use to DF. So you can tune to 500 kilohertz with this. You've got this over here. And this, this is a 360-degree uh, scale with that fine pointer. So you can see where you're pointed to within a degree or so. And you crank it back. The crank goes to the loop on the top of your fuselage, and you turn that. And 0360 is the loop's null, which is what you're looking for, is in line with the long axis of the plane. So you, you, the navigator reports to the pilot. Uh, the beam is, um, uh, okay. Okay, the beam is uh, working, working. One, two, three, I guess so. Uh, the beam is working uh, properly. The pilot will correct for uh, his actual heading and you head towards the, uh, the uh, transmitter. Okay, next. 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 There we go. Okay, here's, uh, anyway, here's a couple guys having a good day. You can see the, uh, the Gibson girl there, and this fellow's presumably pulling down, the, uh, uh, pulling down the kite or the balloon, whichever it was. So, anyway, bound. Next. Uh, and here's some of the, the, pl the systems they used. Uh, the Germans had this Heinkel biplane. You might think, well, that's silly, an old biplane. But, of course, a biplane t tends to have a very low stall speed. So it's, it's coming in hanging at 40, 45 miles an hour, and it can just drop down. And it worked, it worked uh, fine for them. Uh, the Brits developed a series of fast boats, high-speed launches, similar to the US PT boats. Although they weren't as heavily armed, but these things would streak out. And it's uh, there, the, actually, the background and the heart of the RNLI as it exists today, this very special, good, life-saving surface that is, has uh, chapters all around the British Isles. Uh, th and they have some, uh, if you're ever tra traveling over there and you see an RNLI station, stop in and ask, th ask to look at their boats. They have big boats which are unsinkable. They're really interesting. Anyway, so they, back in the war, and, and there was a problem, and that is if the Germans saw uh, a plane go in, then they often would hang around just beyond the horizon and when rescuers came, they'd come over the horizon and try to, to uh, shoot up the PBY or, or the fast boat, whatever it was. So they got in, got, grabbed you, and out they went. And here's a Catalina coming in. They're called the Cancels here in, in Canada, but uh, big, nice, uh, they were used for search, and they were used, obviously, for rescue. Okay, next. Uh, what they finally decided was the best thing to do, in many cases, uh, uh, guys were out in the life raft for many days, and they're you know, uh, dehydrated and starving, and, and many of them had untreated wounds. And so what they finally decided to do was drop them a, a proper boat. Uh, this is a B-17, and see it's still militarized. It's got the top turret and the ball turret and so forth. So the boat will have a mast and sail, uh, food, water, first aid supplies, and a Gibson girl um, bolted to the boat itself, so you could, you could stay in communication. Next. After the war, they took it a step further, and, and this again is a B-17, but there's, there's no guns on it now, it's just, then that saves weight and so forth. Boat underneath, uh, and all painted up uh, in the orange markings of the, the air sea rescue. And, uh, the, the B-17 bomber, of course, and no bombs, so it had a, an excellent range, and so they could go way out looking for people, and again, drop them a boat, and they get out of that wretched little rubber raft and ha have a few essentials of life. Uh, next. Okay, this is a British version they started with, and here's a couple of chaps uh, uh, sailing home, and there's worse endings to uh, uh, being uh, uh, plunged, plunged into the water, and uh, Anyway, uh, next, uh, just a, a couple of examples of what happened. And uh, this is the uh, USS Hope. Uh, it was a brand new hospital ship. Uh, and uh, these four fellows were in a C-47 uh, moving uh, radar parts from one little island in the Pacific to another. Uh, 
they encountered a, a thunderstorm out about the middle of the distance between the two islands, which were pretty far apart. And the pilot, it was pretty vicious, and he didn't want to go through it or over it or under it, so he went around it. But by the time he got around it, um, they couldn't hear the beacon from either of the islands, the one they had just departed from or the one they were flying to. And it may have been partly the, the story I, uh, I read about it didn't mention that there was probably a whole lot of uh, uh, lightning and therefore tons of static at the time when they were close to the, that may have prevented the radio from doing its job. They would have been listening on one of these. Anyway, they couldn't, they couldn't find the way. They tried rough, ready navigation, didn't work. Ran out of gas, sank down, calm, so they all, they got into their little life rafts uh, with a bit of food, which they ate. Next day, big storms, they lost all their food and water, they all got seasick. Uh, they were out there for uh, four days and they cranked right on the, the times they should. And uh, of course, they didn't know if anybody heard them, but this, the ship Hope was actually going its first mission. It was brand new, it was full of nurses and, and physicians. They were going down to the Philippines, which the, the, the Battle of Luzon, I think, was on. Anyways, war in the uh, Philippines. And they would have come actually quite close to the. Uh, uh, for air crew in the boat, but, or in the raft, but uh, not close enough to see them. It was kind of irony. They would have been several miles away and, and they wouldn't have seen them. But they heard them from over 600 miles away and they immediately adjusted their course a bit, picked them up, and, uh, and all was good. So anyway, probably not a bad rescue there. A couple of hundred nice nurses to pay attention to them. Okay, this is uh, the uh, another one, and this was a B-29 that had out over the wide, wide Pacific, had engine failure. Uh, what are we going to do? And they uh, looked at the map, and there were some little uninhabited islands. They were able to make it to one, uh, landed half on the beach. It, it wasn't wide enough uh, uh, to take the, ho the whole plane. So they were half in the water, half out. But they got out and obviously ran the ground into the water, and uh, they, were, they were saved. This is an ASR, or a a AAF. Uh, Army Air Force, which is what the U.S. Air Force was called at that time, Army Air Force Emergency Rescue Squadron. And they've got a big flashy sign up here, and the guy's putting 262, and that will be the number of uh, air crew that that particular unit rescued. And down here they have it another way on a gauge. There's a nice picture under here of uh, fast boats and a PBY and a little guy in his life raft cranking on his uh, Gibson girl. They uh, then had... Um, this was kind of a semi-official badge that you could put it on your class A's, that is your formal uniform, but, and, and it, that was okay. It wasn't really, it wasn't from the army. It was just, uh, anyway, and this says, uh, I've been in the drink. And uh, so I, I think it was a great uh, intro. You went into the bar and everybody wanted you to tell the story of your, your dunk in the, the ocean. Okay, next. And that's it. Other than after all this talking, about the Gibson girl, I thought I might try to crank one up for you. Uh, I knew I forgot something. I'm going to have to settle for a chair. different forms of signal, like A1 means a simple, clean carrier, no modulation. Modulation is you're, you're changing, uh, you're, you're mixing an audio electronic signal with an RF electronic signal. So in this case, it was about a 400 hertz audio signal into a 500 kilohertz radio signal. Oh, okay. And when you look at it, it's, uh, well, this, this is what AM stations use, amplitude modulation, okay. except instead of it being a voice or music, it's just a single tone. And it, it, 